following program is intended for mature audiences. Welcome to Rudy's Revelation, finding revelation in the news and meaning in media. It's Sunday, December 27th, 2020. Today I'll be talking back to the Sunday Talking Heads on CBS Face the Nation, where Frank Figluzzi, the former assistant director of counterintelligence at the FBI, claims that the Tennessee bombing was a lone wolf driven by conspiracy theories. Also be checking in on Sunday Morning Propaganda at our favorite feel-good feature news program, CBS Sunday Morning, where correspondent David Pogue joins the growing bandwagon of leftists in explaining why the pandemic was a good thing. Also be tearing into the Sunday New York Times, showing how the newspaper continually mischaracterizes the facts to mislead the public. And of course, I'll be going over the weekend headlines all in the next 30 minutes. But first I'll be taking you back to school, giving you some historical context to frame this week's news narratives. The word of the day is humanism. A doctrine, attitude, or way of life centered on human interests or values especially, a philosophy that usually rejects supernaturalism and stresses an individual's dignity and worth and capacity for self-realization through Riazzo. And the reason I'm going to talk about humanism is there's been a lot of talk recently about post-humanism. And people think post-humanism in terms of post-human. And I just want to go into here, this is from Wikipedia, anti-humanism, any theory that is critical of traditional humanism and traditional ideas about humanity and the human condition. Cultural post-humanism, a branch of cultural theory critical of the foundational assumptions of humanism and its legacy. Philosophical post-humanism, a philosophical direction which draws on cultural post-humanism. The philosophical strand examines the ethical implications of expanding the circle of moral concern and extending subjectivities beyond the human species. And for people who want to get into humanism, um, they should delve into it uh, quite a bit because it is a vast category. We're going to get to a little bit here on Christian humanism and in particular secular humanism. But if you get into humanism, Humanism came about in the Renaissance, and uh, during the reawakening, as stated here in Britannica, Renaissance is viewed as a distinct historical period. Indeed, the word Renaissance is of more recent coinage. The fundamental idea of that period was one of renewal and reawakening is humanistic in origin. And basically, humanism... Uh, the way it came about in the Renaissance was uh, bringing humans to their full potential. And there are a couple different uh, terms involved in humanism, Christian humanism and secular humanism that we're going to talk about, uh, an intellectual uh, forwarding of mankind. And uh, they talk quite a bit about... um, Petriarch and Boccaccio in terms of individualism and realism. Now, the problem with uh, what's happening now with secular humanism is they are casting individualism and realism aside for socialism and relativism. Now, realism is basically objectivism and uh, is the opposite of relativism or subjectivism. 
and uh, Petriarch or Francesco Petriarca was one of the ones that brought about realism. And Boccaccio brought about um, the idea of individualism. And it goes on here to say uh, that it was forwarded by people like Thomas More and Francis Bacon. And uh, these sort of Renaissance ideas went on to be forwarded by people like John Locke. And it was really uh, one of the basis of the founding of the United States and um, the individualism that and the individual liberties that are protected there. Now, uh, from all about philosophy, I'm going to read a little bit about secular humanism because that's what we're going to be uh, attacking today. Excluding God from schools and society, secular humanism is an attempt to function as a civilized society with the exclusion of God and his moral principles. Now, we talked about humanism before, and uh, there was a great deal and a great uh, to-do about um, exalting man and man's faculties. Uh, but originally, during the Renaissance, that was done in terms of naturalism in conjunction with uh, the faith in God and obviously the doctrines of the Catholic Church. But here, secular humanism is an attempt to function as a civilized society with the exclusion of God and his moral principles. During the last several decades, humanists have become very successful in propagating their beliefs. Their primary approach is to target the youth through the public school system. Humanist Charles Potter writes, education is thus a mo most powerful ally of humanism, and every American school is a school of humanism. What can a theistic Sunday school's meeting for one hour a week and teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? Now we're going to quickly go through from the center of for inquiry, Christian humanism, religious humanism, and secular humanism. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, humanism is evidently under considerable strain, perhaps a victim of its success. Atheists frequently describe their life stance as ethics as humanists. Many humanists retain high regard for Christianity, and many Christians agree with essentials of humanism, especially the ones that were purported in the Renaissance and in the earlier mid to late renaissance but most of the humanist thinking started as early as 1250 christian humanism respects the dignity uh, and mind of humans because god made us and loves us christian humanism was essential to the rise of democracy in europe as thinkers from john locke to thomas jefferson argued for liberty of body and spirit by appealing to our status as divinely created beings christians championed human rights during the formative era for modern democracy, while few atheists, such as Hobbes, Voltaire, and Paine, cheered on the fight. The reformers who wielded political power were Christians. Even a pope or two have proudly worn the mantle of humanism, along with 20th century advocates for peace and central rights leaders who were Christians. Christian humanists have well-placed pride in their humanistic work. And then it goes, unlike humanism, Christian humanism, religious humanism, does not appeal to God's relationship to humans to justify our inherent dignity and liberty. Religious humanism puts humanism first and religion second. What is secular humanism? This is from Got Questions. The ideal of secular humanism is mankind itself as a part of an uncreated eternal nature. And that's where naturalism uh, starts to veer away from uh, faith. Its goal is man's self-remediation without reference to or help from God. Secular humanism grew out of the 18th century Enlightenment and 19th century free thinking. Some Christians might be surprised to learn that they actually share some commitments with secular humanists. Well, humanism grew out of Christian faith. Like I said before, um, Realism and individualism were some of its core tenets that have been cast aside as of late. 
Many Christians and proponents of secular humanism share a commitment to reason, free inquiry, the separation of church and state, and the ideal of freedom and moral education. However, they differ in many areas. Secular humanism based their morality and ideas about justice on critical intelligence unaided by scripture. See, I don't understand where moral education is unaided by scripture. Which Christians rely on foreknowledge concerning right and wrong, good and evil, and although secular humanists and Christians develop and use science and technology, for Christian these tools are to be used in the service of man to the glory of God. Whereas secular humanists view things as an instrument meant to serve human ends without reference to God. In their inquiries concerning the origins of life, secular humanists do not admit that God created man for the dust of the earth, having first created earth and all living creatures on it from nothing. For secular humanist, na nature is an eternal self-perpetuating force. Now, the reason I get into all this, first of all, is because secular humanism has lost its moral compass. And so if you don't relate to any written scripture, the Overton window of morals shifts until it's in a place of immorality, and that's the problem, in my view, of secular humanism. But humanism as a whole, putting man first as supreme being, especially in terms of secular humanism, versus keeping God as the supreme being. And that's the difference there, is the fact that without any sort of moral tether, humanism becomes Satanism, because what happens is you start to become adversarial with God. Obviously, if you're an atheist, that's one of the reasons. So we're going to go right into the re reading recommendations. Less than 3% of you people read books! Western Humanism, A Christian Perspective, A Guide for Understanding Moral Decline in Western Culture. This is a book by John D. Carter. We have another one here. Atheism kills the dangers of a world without God and cause for hope. In Atheism Kills, the author, Barack Lurie, exposes the horrors of a world without God, contrary to the mantra we've heard time and time again that religion is responsible for more deaths than anything else. It is, in fact, the absence of God which has killed in obscene numbers ever since atheism first assumed government control in the French Revolution it has done nothing but kill. You see, governments, um, secular or otherwise, are responsible for most of the deaths on the planet, and particularly in the 20th, 20th century. And the last one here, the suicide of American Christianity, drinking the Kool-Aid of secular humanism. American Christianity is dying a slow death at its own hands instead of positively affecting the secular culture where being infected by it under the guise of being seeker-friendly and loving, soon the church may be an exact mirror of the culture it seeks to destroy. We're going to go on to the headlines here from Politico. Anti-Facebook agitators see their moment under Biden. Joe Biden has said he is no fan of Facebook. Now he has the opportunity to show as he assumes landmark policy and legal battles against the company. What's happening here, I'm not really going to get into the article, um, but now that the uh, social media companies have reached some success, uh, overwhelming success, I might add, they want to get rid of 230 to basically pull up the ladder behind them. For NBC News, Democrats promised Biden-era abortion showdown over the Hyde Amendment. Now, if people don't know what the Hyde Amendment is, the decades-old measure named after Illinois GOP lawmaker limits the use of federal funds. Basically, it says taxpayer funding can't pay for abortion. This is from the Daily Herald of Chicago, the latest driver charged after truck stopped in Tennessee. Now, this is an AP article. Now, everybody knows about the Tennessee blast that leveled a block, and we're going to talk a, a quite a bit about that today because it obviously seems like a false flag uh, led by the FBI. Again, a non-motive attack. The 
so-called attacker died in the process so and he's a lone wolf so you'll never really find out what motivated him and uh, we'll get into that quite a bit but first we want to go into the report of another box truck in Tennessee blaring the same warning message that the RV blared before it exploded in downtown Nashville a sheriff's office in Tennessee says the driver of a box truck that was heard playing audio at a convenience store outside the Nashville has been booked into jail on felony charges. The sheriff's office said that in a statement, the 33-year-old driver, James Turgeon, had been detained on charges with two counts of felony filing a false report and one count of tampering with evidence. Officials say Turgeon received the evidence tampering charge because he was damaged the speaker system wiring intentionally. The Tennessee Highway Patrol said a robot was sent to investigate the truck, but no device was found. This is an old article, AT&T outage continues. By News 4 Nashville, FBI agents investigating a 5G paranoia was behind Nashville bombing. Now this is uncorroborated. They keep saying a witness says that this guy that's a suspect in the attack um, was uh, uh, paranoid about AT&T's 5G. This is from Foreign Policy. China used stolen data to expose CIA operatives in Africa and Europe. The discovery of U.S. spy networks in China fueled a decade-long global war over data between Beijing and Washington. From the Wall Street Journal, investors double down on stocks pushing margin debt to a record. Chasing bigger gains, some have exposed themselves to potentially devastating losses through riskier plays, such as concentrating positions and trading options. This is from Bloomberg. China's economy is set to overtake U.S. earlier due to COVID fallout. The Chinese economy is set to overtake the U.S. faster than previously anticipated after weathering the coronavirus pandemic better than the West. From Reuters, Boston doctor has severe allergic reaction to Moderna vaccine. Again from Bloomberg, Biden calls for more aid spending, warns of darkest days ahead, more aid spending. And you know who owns most of our debt? That must be China. From AP, rare vaccine injury claims steered to obscure federal office. It's from AP, from Bernard Condon and Matt Sedinsky, from the 22nd. Though most people who protect themselves with coronavirus vaccine will never develop serious side effects, most people, such rare cases are barred from federal court and instead are steered to an obscure program with a record of seldom paying claims. The countermeasures the countermeasures injury and compensation program which was set up to, specifically to deal with vaccines under emergency authorization has just four employees and few hallmarks of an ordinary court. Decisions are made in secret by government officials, claimants can't appeal to a judge, and payments in most death cases are capped at 370000 From Fox 5, healthcare worker in NYC has serious allergic reaction to coronavirus vaccine. And from Axios, why Americans will demand to be able to prove they're vaccinated. I don't know if Americans aren't demanding the vaccine and they certainly aren't going to demand. Only the Americans who take the vaccine will demand proof of vaccination. And this, folks, is the mark of the beast. If you haven't read Revelations, I think now is the time. And Axio goes on, you've received the coronavirus vaccination, but can you prove it? The answer to that question will help determine how the global economy functions in the next few years. Why it matters, the big picture. Your employer has clear interest in knowing whether you've been vaccinated. 
there you go. You can't work. You can't travel if you don't have proof of vaccination. As do immigration staff in foreign countries, you may want to visit. Many workers from nursing home aides to opera singers have clear desire and even need to be vaccinated before doing their jobs, which means they'll need some kind of proof of vaccination. And this is what Bill Gates has been pushing for for a decade. We're going to tear into the New York Times. The darkest timeline. Deep adaptation made people confront the end of the world from climate change. Does it matter if it's correct? This paper helped rewrite the direction of British University played a major role in reshaping the mission of climate organizations and religious institutions, had a significant impact on British activism, and has been translated into at least nine languages. It made its author into something of a climate change messiah. The paper's central thought is that we must accept that nothing can reverse humanity's fate and we must adapt accordingly. Hate yourself. Hate yourself. And the paper's bleak, vivid details emphasizing that the end is truly nigh and it will become gruesome clearly resonated. Well, everybody knows we're going to go through the tribulations, um, and it's coming. Now, this is a lead story that's been going around. Uh, She chronicled China's crisis. Now she's accused of spreading lies. Zhang Zan, who reported about the coronavirus from Wuhan during the lockdown, will face trial next week in the first known case against the citizen journalist from the crisis. This is by Vivian Wang of the New York Times. Zan, a 37-year-old former lawyer turned citizen journalist, embodied the Chinese people's hunger for unfiltered information about the epidemic. Now she's become a symbol of the government's efforts to deny its early failings in the crisis and promote a victorious narrative instead. Trump's fraud claims died in court, but the myth of stolen election lives on. For years, Republicans have used the specter of cheating as a reason to impose barriers to the ballot access. A definitive debunking of claims of wrongdoing in 2020 has not changed the message that there's more voter fraud than voter suppression. Do your own research, you'll figure it out. Now they write here, in making their case in real courts in the court of public opinion, Mr. Trump and his allies have trotted out a series of tropes. And you see how mischaracterization, it's not accusations, it's tropes and canards similar to those Republicans have pushed to justify laws that in many cases made voting disproportionately harder for blacks and Hispanics who largely support Democrats. It's just not true. Most people have identification and asking people to bring a electricity bill or a utility bill to prove that you're a resident at said address. I mean, that's not making voting harder. Um, so there, this is just full of mischaracterizations, and they don't even get to the fraud claims died in court um, because nobody even agreed to look at the case or the evidence. And we always end up in the Sunday Review, and the whole Sunday Review this week, uh, which is an op-ed section of uh, the New York Times on Sunday, It says, let's start over. Vaccines are coming. Donald Trump is going. Sometime in 2021, life will look a lot more normal. Not completely normal, of course. But it won't be the same. And the lead one is on politics. Is is normalcy obsolete? Uh, But we are going to concentrate on one because they talk about normalcy on dating the joys of frivolous sex. And this is an opinion piece. The pandemic has brought out nasty puritanism by Megan Nolan. Nolan is a writer and critic. She's a columnist for the New Statesman where she writes about culture and politics. Now, I read this. I don't suggest you read this. Um, But what she does is she goes on about how being criminal promiscuous for some people is part of their identity and that helps them deal with life. For some people, the social comfort comes from dating or having sex with strangers. 
Now she goes into this Dutch, sex is good, sex is healthy. I agree. But promoting promiscuity, having sex with strangers, like not even getting to know somebody before having sex. Like, I'm not a Puritan. You know, I'm. if, if you want to have premarital sex or homosexual sex or... You're free, you know, in this country to do as you wish. But this just shows you where the moral stance is as far as the New York Times is concerned. And that's one of my real concerns is the moral degradation of this country because one way to bring down a country is to <laughs> degrade its moral uh, structure. And the communists know that. I mean, China knows that. So we're going to... Um, Leave you with the talking heads and Frank uh, Figluzzi, the former assistant director of counterintelligence of the FBI. But Frank Figluzzi goes off. And of course, watch him drop these wordings, these phrases um, about what they know, what they don't know, and beginning to set up a narrative that isn't even proven out about the paranoias. And this is, uh, this is the narrative of the 5G the paranoias of 5G, and this is the whole purpose of the motivation for the false flag attack, is uh, trying to demonize any concern about 5G. That's a code for we know who did it. That's a code for we know who did it. You hear law enforcement leaders say things like, they're confident that the city is safe. <laughs> that there is no additional threat. That there's no additional explosives attached to this incident. And that they're confident they will find out who did this. That's a code for, we know who did it. We know who did it. We know who did it. Well, the person of interest that CBS News is reporting is uh, Anthony Quinn Warner. Margaret, I, I do, from observations, experience, and from talking to sources, I do believe that we'll fairly quickly see Warner uh, turn from person of interest to the subject of the investigation. I think right now we're all waiting for DNA results of that tissue that we all heard has been found in and around the scene. I think it's quite likely that this was a suicide mission for this individual. If there's any comfort to be taken here, it's that this may likely end up being not connected to a larger group. <laughs> or organization we know who did it a personal real or perceived uh beef <laughs> out on something that may or may not relate to that at&t building or sending a political or ideological message but rather some personal connection to that building personal connection to that building that's a code Vehicle born improvised explosive device. Vehicle born improvised explosive device. Vehicle born improvised explosive device. How easy is it to make a bomb of that scale and do it underneath the radar without law enforcement knowing this threat was there? We know who did it. The public has to be extremely vigilant about those around them that are talking about acting out we know who did it. The, the notion of a copycat seeing what's happened in Nashville and trying to do this themselves is very real. That's a code. The, the notion of a copycat. But in your professional opinion, operation of this size, could it have been completely undertaken by a single actor? <laughs> we saw this in the, uh, in the bombing of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. We know who did it. We know who did it. Remember, Timothy McVeigh, largely, perhaps with one or two cohorts, uh, did this entirely by himself. That's a code. It's not the last time we'll see this. It's not the last time we'll see this. Witnesses told investigators the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, individual here we're talking about, Mr. Warner, may have had an issue with 5G technology and online conspiracy theories stemming from it. Yep, I don't have to tell you we're living in an incredibly uh, politically charged environment. There's tremendous dangerous polarization and it's being 
fueled by social media conspiracy theorists out there and conspiracy theorists out there we know who did it yes i'm aware that there are groups and individuals who seem to think that 5g technology might be the cause of covid um, that technology generally is targeting us it may be that this is help, uh, partially what drove this individual. And that's why we, we need to speak the truth about <laughs> what 5G is, where COVID came from. All of that increases the possibility of a copycat operator. That's a code. And we've got to be extremely vigilant as we move into the next couple of weeks where yeah. we're going to see the nation increasingly polarized about election results and a coming inauguration. It's not the last time we'll see this. All right, we're going to leave you with uh, Sunday Morning Propaganda and David Pogue, who is jumping on the bandwagon with the leftists, touting how great that pandemic has been because of the environmental gains that we have achieved. 2020 will not be remembered as a big year for good news. But science and technology actually scored a few triumphs, beginning with the piece of software that made it possible for meetings, Gabri, classes, relationships, and performances to carry on. I'm referring, of course, to Zoom video calls. So am I correct that you had never used Zoom until the lockdown began? Absolutely not. I was amazed when I first saw it. Apple, Google, and Microsoft all had their own similar video programs. Why do you think Zoom became the winner of the pandemic? All the Zoom meetings meant fewer people flying, and all the closed offices meant fewer people driving. It's not the kind of economy anybody wants, of course. But it did lead to some more good news. For the first time in a century, you could hear birdsong in the cities. You could see fish in the canals of Venice. And you could see blue skies in LA. Global greenhouse gas emissions fell 17%, the biggest drop in human history. This was also the year that the plastic pollution problem finally got the world's attention. We've been dumping the equivalent of a truckload's worth of plastic into the ocean every minute of every day. China joined over 125 other countries that ban or tax single-use plastic or plastic bags. But you don't have to be a government to make a difference. Use your voice, go out there, do what you can. Ordinary citizen Sheila Moravati was fed up with the 40 billion plastic utensils that restaurants include with takeout orders every year that nobody uses. So if I take it out of the takeout bag and throw it in the trash, that's not single-use plastic. That's zero-use plastic. <laughs> Moravati undertook a one-woman campaign to persuade delivery services like Uber Eats and Postmates to make those utensils optional. Uber Eats and Postmates now have a checkbox that says, if you would like plastic cutlery, click here. <laughs> Finally, 2020 ended with the best piece of news science could possibly have offered us. Vaccines for the disease that ruined the year in the first place. Do you have any uh, broader thoughts about the year 2020? <laughs> I'll be glad when 2020 is gone. All right, that's it for us. We'll see you next week. Rudy's Revelation. Check us out on Twitter and Facebook. <laughs>